title of Jill's uh, presentation is Situated Learning. Hi, Susan. How's it going? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Jill Banting, and the title of my, presence, of my presentation is called Situated Learning Community Engagement. So, I'm from Vancouver Island, and I've been living near Campbell River for about three years. Does anybody here know? Where Campbell River is? Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's a really beautiful place. I highly recommend going there. I am. Um, I finished my BFA at Emily Carr and Courtney at NIC in the Comox Valley. So, just in case anybody doesn't know, there is a branch of Emily Carr on Vancouver Island in Courtney. And uh, after I graduated from my BFA, I started working with the Campbell River Arts Council, where I've been developing a community engaged methodology for the past three years. And uh, that's the work that I presented to Chris to enter into the studies at, uh, program here. So um, that's Kent Blackburn on the left. He's the executive director of the Arts Council. And on the right is Erica Benson, who is a uh, resiliency trainer and youth worker in Campbell River. And um, this is an example of a community engaged space that we've been occupying in the downtown. And it's one example of many of the different things that I've been doing. So I use interdisciplinary and visual dialogical methods that are participatory and collaborative. And I make projects in community with and for community partners. So Arlene Goldbart is a wonderful writer. And um, she, just to quote her here, community cultural development is, um, are the activities that we do with communities and in specific contexts that help to grow um, social, cultural, and economic, in economic ways. So an arts-based community development mandate is what the Arts Council uses, and so that's how I started, that's how I was introduced to community engaged work. So I started doing a practice called graphic recording, and it is a way of listening and learning and communicating, and it happens at events, and it happens in public and in private, and it's um, during situations where there's information being shared and there's uh, communication happening, consensus building, things like that. So I've done a lot of these works and they really informed my practice in terms of getting to know the community and the people and some of the different issues that are there. And so a lot of them were turned into public art pieces and Eventually, I became kind of exhausted by that practice, but in the process of doing that, I learned that there is an aspect of learning that is visual, and when combining language and imagery, there's some sort of uh, strange energy that's created in the consciousness of, of uh, the person who's making the work. So these are some examples of some of the other community projects that I did uh, before I entered the program. Poetry on windows in the shopping district downtown. This is a work by Harold Rennish. It's a poem that's very site specific right on the foreshore in downtown Campbell River. This is a work that I did with a youth drop-in center and it was done in dialogue and it was one of my first collaborations with a group of people who were considered to be marginalized and at risk. So that um, is a vinyl window decal that was installed into this sort of solarium at the site at the youth uh, drop-in center. This was a, a 
wall tattoo project at an alternate school, and it was it was a invitation for the students to uh, design and make decals that expressed their identities and individuality, and they were they were allowed to decal the school and um, sort of re take ownership of the school space. So there's some examples of text, symbols, images, poetry, different types of mark making in a sense in the school environment. This is a mural that I painted at a, this is out in front of the sexual health clinic at the school and it creates a sense of place and it creates an identifiable space that is in front of the uh, clinic. And this is a, a text work that I did. It was a storytelling piece that I collaborated with one of the uh, senior members of the community. It was put in the community center and it was a story about how the original community hall was built. And he was there and he was telling me how the floor was installed. So just in terms of getting a, a grasp of the historical context of community art after I entered the program, I started to really appreciate the history of community arts and where it comes from and just how essential it's been in developing um, community engaged art as a, as a, as a form. So, um, this is an example of the Great Wall of LA, which is a work with, uh, by, done by Judy Baca. And it involved hundreds of people. And this is a, a great example because it uses visual images and it, it's about renegotiating history. And as you can see in the slide above, it's, it's about community activity. It creates these hubs of activity. And it also resulted in this really significant artwork that stretched over 2,500 feet. And it was about retelling and reframing cultural histories of ethnic communities, women, and minorities in California. So Baca's work is really significant in that she uses collaborative structures to educate both viewers and participants about social justice issues and stimulating dialogue and community development. So the mural created a social presence and a visual legacy that are significant to place. So in terms of my research early on, I started to ask how are artists using dialogue, participation, and storytelling to make public art that affects social change? And what kind of effects are they having in the community? Then I discovered Grant Kester and the dialogical aesthetics. Uh, I realized through the graphic recording work that that was a form of entering into dialogue through art making and through visual imagery. So I became really interested in his ideas about that. Um, the sense of intersubjectivity and vulnerability and openness to the participant and what what comes into being through that kind of exchange. So in the fall, I entered into the research stage, the first uh, second semester, and I was in the, this pop-up studio that was in downtown Campbell River. And so I started to explore some different things. I got pretty scattered, it was, it was hard to stay really focused because it was just so much research to do. Um, so I attempted to ground my practice in this studio space and I held a series of art groups, classes, and community dialogues that, um, this, is, this is an image of the art group. This was a really important place in terms of youth because in Camp River, there's really nothing for youth to do after school. And in terms of supporting young artists, they outside of art class. There really wasn't anything. So I really enjoyed meeting and gathering with these their teenage kids um, and making art and entering into dialogue with them through art about things they cared about and things that were going on in their lives. 
So this again is a slide from before, but it's a good example. I really enjoyed the slide because it's an image of people in dialogue with an image of dialogue in the background. And so this is, in this space, um, people started to be attracted to it and city planners and cultural stakeholders started to drop by and we started to talk about city planning and, and cultural development and architecture, public spaces and, and so that was really exciting. So I was learning through having these conversations with people and I started to document the work using video and posting them on the web and trying to sort of grapple with how do I document this and, and what is the artwork and how does it become more of a tangible form. So, um, after the, the cube ended up closing down, and so I didn't have a studio anymore, and uh, I was exhausted by image making, so I was in Fiona Bowie's class at the time, and I decided to have a studio day downtown. So, what I did was I used the Dereem approach to, to to explore the city as an image and as a as a sculpture in a way, as a studio space. So this is an image of the downtown and in the foreground is benches in a public square and then this beautiful monument to logging. That's Lauder Mike, that's one of the only pieces of public art in the Campbell River. And um, so I started to look at the city differently. I started to look at signs. I started to look at the symbols. I started to look at the artwork and try and decipher it and try and, and, and figure out what is this place and attempting to generate a new relationship with it. So I started to look at it a little bit differently. And and then I, so I was walking through the space, looking at the photographs, and I, I met the security guard. And this is a very place-specific kind of conversation, but this image is of some public washrooms that were installed beside the art gallery. And there was a big public debate around it, and they were really quite, they spent a lot of money on it, and nobody liked them. And they just kept throwing money at it, trying to disguise them and make them into something nicer looking. And so there's, there's no public art policy in the city, so I was sort of at a loss as to how to enter into that conversation with people. So I just I started talking to the security guard who was walking past the art gallery, and we were talking about the public washrooms, and he started telling me some interesting stories about that. He said that at nighttime, up to eight people will pile into these washrooms and lock themselves in there to sleep because there's nowhere for them to sleep. So in the morning, the, the AM security guard comes along and kicks them all out. So in terms of social sculpture, it, it was an interesting example to me of how, how things happen and and these, these these structures are created and how people end up using them in ways that fulfill a need. And I, I just thought that was really interesting. So um, I then had an encounter with a woman outside the library and we started to have a conversation and I was really interested in this aspect of conversational engagement and connected knowing in the way that we create identities through talking with other people. And this led me to think about Suzanne Lacey's work and the Crystal Quilt and how she does these performative orchestrated uh, events that involve people who, who discuss and enter into conversation about their lives and things that matter to them. So, after that derive and the encounters and the security guard, I started to think about voice, place, identity, and narrative as these key themes that I could potentially focus on to develop a more fluid sort of methodology. And 
I'm interested in what the role of, of place, identity, and narrative are in the creation of dialogue and in building a sense of community. Uh, cancer notes, I'll probably just go through this quickly, but Suzanne Lacey does situated practice. She, this, she spent seven days in the hospital taking notes, talking to people about cancer and death and all these different things. And I found that really exciting. This was an orchestrated dialogue on a rooftop between teenagers and police. Uh, I enjoy this work because it's very confrontational and it's risky and it involves clashes and putting people together that might not necessarily want to talk. Stephen Wylance is a really interesting artist who I'm researching and I'm curious about the way that he deals with social systems and architecture and the way that people, um, he works with people who, who live in housing complexes and he, he engages with people and he's interested in the way that created, uh, people create identities and these self-organizing systems within control structures. And lastly, I got to go to Portland to the Open Engagement Conference, which is great, and I would highly recommend going. It's free. It's in Portland at the university there. And I was introduced to social practitioners and other ways of working, and Harold Fletcher, uh, he's a teacher there. This is an example of some of his work that he did when he was a master's student. So what he did was they got a, a vacant storefront for free, and they started putting art shows together using place-specific objects that they would gather from around that particular site. So I'm really curious about his methodology because it seems very random, and it's also playful, and it pokes fun at established art codes, and it elevates everyday objects and everyday people and experiences in, by turning them into art. So in terms of pursuing this dialogical work, what is at stake? According to Kester, it's its ability to catalyze emancipatory insights through the dialogue. So with my thesis work, the challenge is going to be the structures of engagement and how to, what is the dialogue for, like what am I trying to stimulate and with whom and why. And I'm, I'm going to be doing an internship with Public Art Mark in the fall and with Dr. Cartier and I'm hoping to find some situations there that could potentially reveal themselves. And like Fletcher, he discovers things, he allows things to present themselves to him. So it's not so much about finding an issue and trying to tackle it, it's more allowing things to appear. So that's where I'm at. Hi, Jill. Can you hear me? Hi, uh, Well, first off, I just want to say I really enjoyed your presentation. Thanks very much. And um, uh, just like on a, on a stylistic note, one thing I noticed you did that I really enjoyed is you did provide a lot of uh, reference in the form of quotation, but you always paraphrased it. And I really enjoyed that kind of counterpoint between being able to read the quote, but getting your take and sort of elaboration on it at the same time. Um, as far as your, so I, I just want to say I enjoyed that. <laughs> um, as far as your practice, I thought you really presented it well. Um, for someone like myself, uh, who's you know, fairly uninformed, um, the contextualization of it, um, in a sort of a historical context of social and, and situated work, you made it really, really clear 
you spent a really good amount of time on it and then dove into your own specific work. So that I really enjoyed as well. So I guess the question that this is leading to is I felt that you sort of outlined a narrative in the whole presentation uh, about yourself, even though a lot of your work uh, maybe doesn't place yourself in the center of the work or the activity. And when you started to speak about the Dereev approach, I felt a shift. And uh, I just wondered if my interpretation of that shift would be correct. My, my impression was that up until that point, your work um, perhaps can be described as like an activator or a facilitator. Uh, it seems like you're maybe changing your own position within your work um, to be more in the center of the orbit. I don't really have a, a way to, to describe this. Um, and I was wondering if you're going to present something uh, you know, in the near future where we can kind of see this new direction that you're pursuing. Um, but I'm wondering if that perception is correct uh, in terms of putting yourself more in the center of the work, uh, or if there is no shift in the way that you're engaging uh, with, uh, with the community in, in which you're working now. The center of the work meaning when I'm the subject of the work? Um, yeah, I guess what I'm asking is, it seemed prior to the Dereev approach in your presentation, um, you would let participants um, bring forth whatever was at the center of the work. And my perception was now you're looking for the subject matter and trying to draw that out of people. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Um, that's a good question. I think the dream approach was a shift towards, towards social space. So moving away from community arts organization and social service groups and um, public art policy and that kind of thing, moving towards into my own practice. It's coming from my own center. So. I guess it was more of an attempt to find my own voice within that practice. And it still involves other people, but it's not so much about organizational mandates, etc. It's more about my own sense of discovery. It's quite a bit of resonance with um, Jay and Lee's presentations earlier about giving up control to because the Dereev is a situation as kind of strategy to employ a kind of a program here at the center of it, but there's, you're also following a kind of control script that you put in place for things to, to invoke things to happen. But if I can follow on the Ouija question a bit, it seems to me, I'm curious about the role of politics here. Um, the way you described Kester was really clear, I, I thought it's uh, obvious you really grasp that for yourself, but when he's talking about emancipatory uh, Freedom, you describe this as something, I think you said you enjoyed the ele elevating people to, into artworks. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really key. Um, his question about, a, or his notion about emancipatory strategies, when, when we talk about freedom, we're invoking a question about what is not freedom. Mm -hmm. And the answer to that will be a, a certain kind of politic. Yeah. How do you, what are your, Politics. Are you willing to uh, to put them out there, or, or, mm -hmm. or do you do you want to work with them in a covert way? Um, I think I'm willing to be seen as a a politician. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in exploring the way artists can engage in social and political realms. Um, and I, I love Joseph Boys, and I'm curious about his idea of art as politics. I, I think what I'm curious about in terms of emancipatory, I'm more interested in emancipatory pedagogy, I think. And in terms of emancipatory politics, I don't really know yet. Um, in terms of Marple, so you're going to be in Marple yeah. in the fall. What, what do you, you said you want to discover something there. What do you mean? Do you feel you'll be bringing tools to discover? 
tools of discovery were involved. Um, well, honestly, I don't know anything about Marple yet. So I think the approach to Marple is going to be probably a synthesis of the community engaged work and the Jareeb approach and also research and potentially more um, organized systems of information gathering. Part of the, part of the project of Marple is quantitative data and trying to show through Gather, not necessarily just making art, but trying to show and evaluate how public art can, or how it impacts communities. So that's sort of that's sort of branching into research, a different kind of research. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah, no, that's uh, continuing the discussions. Very interesting. Hello. Hello. Along the lines of the last two questions, um, and I think this fits in. One thing I've noticed that uh, you seem to be getting more comfortable doing is directly talking to people outside of any institutional setting. Mm -hmm. And you're talking to specific people that are in service with of those institutions. Um, so the security guard, I know another project you're working on in the future, and um, to me, along with what Chris said, that's a direct political act. I wonder if you may feel that way and if it's something you might also want to employ in my poll, and is that also, with the first comment and question, something like how you right now inserting yourself in the work because you aren't just recording anymore? Mm -hmm. uh, are you instigating comments out of your relationship with the institution? Is there a reason you're going directly to these people? Yes and no. I mean, part of, part of doing any kind of relational work is that have to, I have to question my own reasoning, I, and I think um, what I'm laying around with, because I'm in an institution right now, I can't not ask those questions about what that means to be a part of an institution. And being a part of the Arts Council, that was also an institution as well. Um, I guess what I'm hearing you saying is that, or asking is, am I the one who started to those conversations as opposed to not? Is that the question? Sorry. As opposed to just listening, as opposed to just being sort of an observer or a recorder? Yeah, I think so. I think I'm moving into more of an active role as a, as a creator of situations, as a creator of events, as a creator of, of dialogues that are more coming from my own sense of values. So I think my politics are more about getting more towards heart-based kind of realities. What is your lived experience right now? What matters to you? What's important? And how can we do things, small things, short-term things, that will create a feeling of emancipation maybe from those situations without, without thinking that you have to make some sort of grand political action Very interesting. So we have time for one last comment. I think Andres has had his hand. I'm Andres. Thank you, Jill. That's a very exciting presentation. Um, my question is about the dynamic nature of, of uh, the artifact or the dialogue you're initiating. And I was very intrigued by that uh, notion of uh, graphic recording and the, the, well, what is obviously starts out as a protocol of a discussion, but, but it's so much more by the, by the colors and by being a picture. But then I'm assuming at some point the recording is finished and, and uh, stands there as a result, the same with the Los Angeles wall. And 
I was wondering, and that's why I like the blackboard actually so much because I'm, I'm assuming that it can constantly be changed and grow, which I find is crucial for you know talking about social change. Mm -hmm. So, what is your, what are your ideas on on initiating something that can be more uh, a dialogue in, pro, in, in progress as opposed to an artifact? So, mm -hmm. how dynamic is is what you want to create? Yeah. That's a really interesting question. Um, I'm curious about this concept of the third object, which uh, was presented by Claire Doherty at Book Negation, where there's, there's a dialogue, but that there's an object to attach that dialogue to that represents aspects of that dialogue. So yeah, the graphic recordings were objects, and I think that's why I, I moved towards the blackboard, chalkboard idea, because I was looking at images of Joseph Boys in the Tree University, and his blackboard was sort of like a homage to that in a sense, but it was also more about transience and the transition between, between dialogues, and, and trying to let go of the image, and trying to let go of the artifact. I think there's a time and a place for it, and it's it's functional in some situations. Like uh, the graphic recordings, sometimes were were put on display as a public artwork. But they're also put online as like a banner on a website, or as uh, little vignettes and slideshows. So was, I was I was curious to see how the object was then, was then translated again by the by the user of the of the image in various iterations. But I think there, there is, that's something I'm grappling with in my methodology is the process and then the product. What is the product? I don't know. I just want to have, uh, get one last question from Melanie. She's in first year. I think there's a real resonance between your practices. Yeah. Just full disclosure, I'm on the more political side of this whole thing. But um, my question um, is just around if you found it, there's any tension between uh, the anonymity that comes with the community as a whole, um, the role of the institution, and then pulling out those personal narratives and personal stories about gender, about race, identity, uh, of any lived experience. Anonymity being? Uh, just like a community as a whole, you know, sort of like a faceless, a generic, faceless, like, yeah, generic, um, you know, like an ethnic minority. within a system, yeah. within a you know community that's a product of um, policy, that's uh, yeah. history, so on and so forth, and then pulling out those individual stories. Do you find any tension to that, or how is that influenced or seen through your work? Um, I'm more comfortable with personal narratives because I think that each person is unique and within their story is, is just all the keys and themes to artwork. So I'm curious what the narrative is, a, as, as not only in method but also in methodology. Uh, it, all, it has to do with identity and, and labels and I think it's, it's complicated because once you start using words like ethnic minority and marginalized groups, then I'm implicating and I'm placing myself in a central location. So I would actually prefer to let that vocabulary go at some point and start to see individuals as being unique and special. And uh, I'm not really sure how to negotiate that yet because part of it is about language labels and vocabulary. I'd be curious to talk to you more about that later. Yeah, I really think you should, and uh, it's true, words follow one another right after politics. Uh, ethics is often quite on its heels, isn't it? Yeah, I oh. just met the ethics board last week. Oh, good, okay. Was there Jacques Rancière on the board? Well, actually, no, it was Lois Classen. Oh, okay, right. Lois Classen is... His week off. Yeah, she's great. She's very approachable, so I'd encourage anybody who wants to work with the community to definitely get in touch with her and make sure that they know that there is a protocol to follow when you're at the school. Great, thanks very much, Joe.
going to take a few minutes to change over to our last